one. You're going to go webinar and then we're live on Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Hello, everyone. We're going to wait a, a couple seconds. We've got just a few people on here now. I'm Dr. Lucia Vasquez. The webinar is now live and I believe we are now streaming via Facebook. Uh, welcome very, uh, very, very, see, I, I'm all excited. I'm so excited. I'm tired. This is the art and legacy of Ricardo Favela. This is part of our seen and unseen uh, series. So if we could have the Zoom master put up our slides, uh, I will give you some uh, details uh, about our program. Um, so again, here we are. So welcome. Today we ha are hosted by Eddie Salas, who I'll be introducing in a minute, and he will be introducing our wonderful guests for our, our what we call this a platica, a little, a little chat. Um, can I have the next slide, please? These platicas are part of a larger uh, a, a grant that we received to be able to engage the community into talks about Chicano art and specifically the legacy of Mr. Ricardo Jesus Favela, who uh, is from the Central Valley here in California. He went to Danuba High School and then is a COS alum before he went off to Sacramento and uh, was one of the co-founders of the Royal Chicano Air Force. So we are privileged enough to be able to show uh, Mr. Uh, Favela's work, next slide please, at the Visalia Arts um, uh, Museum. And we've been extended until April 30th. So if you would like to go see his work in person, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Justin, the IT guy, to go ahead and put the phone number in there uh, or to visit www.artsvisalia.org, especially for those of you that are watching this video a little bit later or on Facebook. Uh, we go until April 30th, uh, we will be guests at the Arts Visalia Museum. So please call, make your appointment so you can come in, ver in, in person. There is also a virtual option. Next slide, please. It's a beautiful show. And I'd be happy to meet you there and walk with you if you'd like. As always, thank you to our sponsors. Our sponsorships have grown and grown, and we just have wonderful people in the community that are working with us to make this possible. Next slide, please. I do want to tell you that we do have a few more events uh, to wrap up our season. On April 10th, we will be blowing it up with some Chicano music uh, on Facebook Live from 5 to 9 p.m. Uh, and when it gets closer to the date, we will give you the um, the links for that so that you can see it by Facebook. And we might even tell you where we are. Uh, and that will be April 10th from 5 to 9. On April 25th, it's our first uh, film, and we'll have a youth platica talking about the film Singing Our Way to Freedom. If you aren't interested in getting tickets, for that. Again, I'm going to ask the IT person to put our email seen and unseen one at gmail.com so that you can get tickets. And that the platica, the little discussion we're going to have about the film, we will be having uh, Paul Espinosa, the uh, producer of the film, and also uh, Miguel Vasquez, and so hopefully some other musicians to be able to uh, entertain you and talk to you about the film. Uh, and then on the 30th, we this the film, the uh, art show, like I told you, will be running through the entire month of April. And we are planning, in the planning stages, of doing a Chicano literature platica as well. So thank you very much. Uh, those of you that have done Zoom before, uh, you know where the chat features are. This is meant to be interactive, so if you could look down at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen where it says chat, feel free to make your comments uh, uh, and then in the Q&A to ask your questions. We will stop at 8 o'clock so that we can answer some of those questions. So uh, feel free to chat among yourselves. Be respectful. Be kind. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to introduce our host for this evening. Next slide, please. Eddie Salas, and he is going to introduce himself and our guest for this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Enjoy. Okay, uh, buenas noches. My name is Eddie Salas, and I am the curator of the Seen and Unseen Ricardo Favela Expressions of Chicana, Chicano Art exhibit. And today we have with us uh, three guests who are very intimately tied to uh, Ricardo Favela. First is his daughter, Florentina Favela, and then his sister in law. Um, Josie Talamantes, Josephine Talamantes, and then to close it out, we're going to have uh, Richard Montoya, who is Jose Montoya's son. Um, uh, 
Can you put back the slide? Yeah, there you go. Um, and don't worry about te technical difficulties because there will be some. <laughs> there will be some, and there's pantos in the house, so the cuckoo is here. Don't trip. <laughs> um, uh, this uh, uh, this image right here, uh, the favela and uh, Luis Gonzalez, Louis the footmate, is probably one of the um, I, I would say it was one of the, one of the most well known. Uh, images of the RCAF. And it, what it was was a business card of the Centro de Artistas. They got blown up into a poster, but, but, it, but it has a lot of, um, of, of uh, iconography, some images, you know, there's a, 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 maybe it's Favela holding it up, maybe it's Louis, maybe it's Ricardo throwing in the paint in it. And, and it's, there's an easel and that's a silk screen. And that's, you know, uh, an image of uh, that's uh, Favela's Calaveras. And uh, one thing has, that has come out throughout the show and that should be known is that Ricardo Favela was doing uh, Calaveras that are now made famous by Dia de los Muertos long before or, or, or just as long as the whole procession, the whole uh, ceremony of Dia de los Muertos has been on in the United States or in California. And it, what's, what's interesting to note is that uh, favelas, calaveras are, are three-dimensional. They're not flat. They're human beings. They're, they're characteristic of us because uh, life and death are two sides of the same coin. So that's one thing I think that uh, uh, really has shown throughout this uh, exhibit is that favelas use of calaveras are not uh, just one-dimensional. They're very much alive and they're more, very much uh, reflective of us as human beings. So if you can go to the next uh, uh, slide. Then the next one, and I'm gonna ask Josie, this woman right here, you know her name. I, I know her name and I forget it, but I would just like to say that uh, she's passed and it's just ironic that she's there. And I, I, don't, I don't know if she's one of the Baca family. I think she's one of the Baca. Um, but uh, really a uh, uh, great person. And so it's just ironic. I think I said there's going to be spantos here. There's going to be spirits of the past. And there she is. And the Water Art Program was something that came out of um, the uh, Sac State. And it was a concept that right away when Chicano Studies became, uh, 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 what it, it, ethnic studies, Chicano studies became indoctrinated into the, the curriculum at Sac State. There was a concept that was called uh, 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 como universidad, community university, the combination of those two words is how to bring higher education to the community and how to use the community's and, uh, uh, intelligence and education to educate the university. So it was a, it was a really a, a prolific uh, a concept and it, it spurred the Barrio Art Program, the Chicanito Science Project, and also Breakfast for Niños. So you had an opportunity for young kids to eat breakfast in the morning who otherwise wouldn't. That was a concept that came from the Black Panthers. That is what we find today in all the uh, Title I schools where kids get free lunches. That came from the Black Panthers. The Chicanito Science Project with Sam uh, Quinones, I mean, with Sam uh, uh, Rios, uh, rest in peace, Sam, uh, um, is that um, it was the precursor to what we call now the STEM program, way back when. And of course, the Vario Art program was teacher education. It was to teach potential teachers how to engage in the Vario with children who they were gonna engage with anyway, and teach them basic art projects that would help them put those projects in play in their classrooms with minimum amount of money. So we didn't have to wait for a grant. We could use uh, we could use popsicle sticks, we could use yarns, and as this right here, we could paint a glove or we could paint a hand and we could also put it on a piece of paper and we could make images of our hands and poems and things like that. So with that, and uh, one thing I, I wanted to say is that, um, I, I just wanted to introduce myself as Eddie Salas and um, 
I think I, I was thinking about this and how I came to know uh, the RCAF and how I how I came was that um, you know I'm a son of a of a of a farm worker and a city girl. My mom was born in Palo Verde, which is Chavez Ravine, which is Sunset Boulevard side in 1933. My dad was born in 1929 in, in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, when he he was from uh, Fabians by Chara El Paso. But uh, he was on the uh, migrant trail, so they went up to New Mexico, and that's where he was born. And then he went to the uh, 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 in Ielton in the Sacramento Delta. He signed up for the the service in 1948. There was no war, and he ran into the Korean War. And when he came out, the family had moved to LA, and he went to a, a dance hall that's very famous for Mexican Americans. It's called the Zenda Ballroom, where you could have seen Tito Puente. And you could have seen all the big bands and all the Chicanos. Uh, they went there and they danced, you know, and they had a good time. And my dad met my mom. And so uh, they were involved. They had uh, six, six of us. And my mom was very involved in the old war on poverty. And my father became uh, the first Chicano school board member with the Union High School District with my mom pushing. And so I, uh, grew up in a home that had a lot of consciousness. And by the time I was 10 years old, which would have been 1965, just so you know, my aunt had called from Pittsburgh, California and told us, don't eat grapes, that there's a boycott. And so we didn't eat grapes. And that word Chicano, all the activity behind it in LA at that time where I grew up in Southeast LA, it just, it just, took me, it just took me by just, I was Chicano by 10 years old and going with my grandparents who didn't speak English and one who lived in, in the Temple Street Barrio, which is an old Pachuco Barrio in LA on the West side. And then my, uh, my father's parents always lived in a barrio, either it was Barrio Nowak, One Ways Nowak, Carmela. And then they settled in Fullerton, Tokerstown in the barrio because my grandmother was a Pentecostal and she always was by the church. She was like a, what they call a holy roller, right? So uh, my grandma uh, lived across here from the church, you know, and, and so uh, in the barrio. So I always grew up in that type of a, a, a atmosphere, that type of environment, that, that type of life, which was dynamic with all this culture and the the tienda at the corner and the and the music and the people and so when I came to live in Pittsburgh California with my Nina you know and and uh, my Nina was a very strong chavista and I ran into a friend and one day my friend says uh, Fernando Camarillo rest in peace Bernie uh, he said let's go to Sacramento to La Raza bookstore so La Raza bookstore so I almost down the river road, down Freeport, all the way downtown on 13th Street. And there, lo and behold, I met two dudes that are have had an impact on my life. One was Louis Gonzalez, Louis the Foot, and the other was Philip Santos the Pike. And it was like an amazing engagement. And from that point forward, I engaged with the RCAF. And, and it was probably 1976, 75, 76, <coughs> 76, 77. But then there was this dude. And uh, for some reason, uh, they called him Monjo. They called him the monk. You know, favela. They called him, you know, uh, herbal. They called him all these names. But for some reason, Ricardo and I, we hit it off. I think he took me home to meet his wife the first night to tell you the truth, to have dinner. Come on, come to the house, you know? And so from that point forward, Mo was my homeboy. You know, at first, you know, he was, he was, he was older than me. He was more seasoned than me. And, and he even called me Fast Eddie. He called me Fast Eddie because as he said, when I was quite young, as a young boy, I was, I was bouncing out the walls because I wanted to make change. I wanted there to be change in, in the world 
because as a Chicano, I, I, I understood the inequality. I understood that things weren't right. And I understood we had a culture and, and, and we had so much, but we were not being recognized. And so uh, Montoya, Jose Montoya was fast, did he calm down? But I said, but no, Jose, we gotta, we gotta do this and we gotta do that. And so that's where I got my name, Fast Eddie, from Favela, because Favela would give names to people. So he named me Fast Eddie. And so, you know, and from that, um, I had this uh, 30-some year run with my homeboy. We just hung out and we go down the river and we talk, man, and, and it would always be these, these um, talks about community, talks about our lives, talks about, about you know, uh, we, we, we call Chicano stuff with an SH, you know, that's what we call it. But we would sit there and we would, we would um, change the world, really. We would change the world and then we'd have to come back to Sacramento so kicking back. And if you've ever been to Sacramento and if, you, if you've never been down the, into the Delta, you're really missing a, a, a part of uh, the state of California that's it's just beautiful. And uh, you can even find farm workers there if you, if you don't, you don't have to look very far, but you find pairs and you find the people working and you find little spots and uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a place. And I spent much of my time because I know for a fact that my grandparents, that my, my aunts and uncles, they worked in that area. They worked in that land because they lived in the farm labor camp in Isleton, California. So I know that. And I know they worked in the canneries that were there because there was two of them. And I know this, and this part of my history. So um, I wanted just to say that um, to how I come to this show, how I came to understand Chicano art because it reflects who I am. And, and, uh, it, it's much, much more than just the images. It's the food, it's the it's the platicas, it's the literature, it's the poetry, it's, it's our lives. It's all those beautiful low riders. You know, it's, it's the conjuntos, it's, it's, it's everything. It's, it's, it's a lot. And it's not dependent on your, on your skin color, it's dependent on your heart, really. And the heart is located, you know, hooks to the mouth and to the brain and, and that's life. So anyway, I wanna I wanna now uh, introduce uh, well, Eddie, Florentina. Eddie, ah, Lu ah. Lupe responded, the woman is Tina Godinas. That's she, it, Tina Godinas. Uh, excuse me. Uh, she's the uh, Lupe says she's the daughter of of uh, Teresa no. Godinas. Okay, Tina Godinas. Yes, yes, Tina. Good to see you, girl. <laughs> That's Thank you, Lupe. Thank right, you, Lupe. Tina. Yeah, right on, Tina. Eddie, we have Thank a couple you. of other comments here uh, that Albino Chavez started the Chicanito, the Chicanito Science Project. Yes, he did. And, and also, too. we have... Uh, that the artwork layout that of the fire that we just showed was layout by Chico Lot. Okay, okay. There Thank you, you go. And that was, yes, and she's Fox's niece. Uh, Frank Godina is a Fox, another pivotal member of the RCF of, uh, of the philosophical wing. He talked to Quetzalcoatl on the mural at Southside Park and probably really in his dreams as well. So I'd like to introduce Florentina Favela. Thank you, Eddie. Appreciate it. Um, so could we go for the next slide, please? I wanted to bring some pictures of um, my father to kind of, uh, this is the unseen part, right? So these are pictures of his childhood, um, him as an infant, as a, as a little boy. He was born Richard Favela. Actually, Favela was spelt with a B at the time um, in 1944. Uh, he, he was born in Kingsburg, but he grew up in Dinuba. Next slide. This is um, 
I, I felt that this picture was critical to put in um, on any kind of presentation of my dad because this is a uh, part of him growing up is his younger brother Michael. Um, his younger brother Michael actually passed away um, after they were playing football and he died of an aneurysm and, and things like this. Um, you know, a lot of us who got to know um, my dad knew the depth of wisdom that he had as well as the depth of humor. And it's just amazing that um, he had went through so many tragedies in life at, at a young age. Um, to come out kind of at, at the other end as this um, this person who had just such a strong tie to his culture and his community. Next slide, please. It's also uh, important to note, and this is something that also helped define who he was um, and, and his path and his trajectory to education. He was the first in his family to graduate from high school. Uh, as a kid, he would tell the stories of how he almost had to suppress his intelligence as, as, as a young Chicanito growing up in the San Joaquin Valley. He, he, in his words, he would do all the things that young Chicanito, Chicanitos would do, right? Um, including, you know, getting involved in gangs and getting involved in things that you shouldn't be getting involved in, right? And so those are the, the decisions and the choices he made as, as a young man. Um, growing up though, he had an affinity for education. He had a love for learning. And he would tell us that he would resist, um, hold back a lot on doing well on his specific homework and papers and things like that. Because of course, the, the one time he does, you know, a really stellar essay and he gets compliments from his teacher, all his homeboys are over there calling him, you know, oh, you know, like look at the professor and, you know, giving him a bunch of grief over it. So. Um, he graduated from high school, um, kind of as an average student, but it, it was something that really opened the doors to the rest of his life. Next slide, please. This picture I love. Um, this is a group of the RCF members. You can see dad there with his sunglasses. Um, my tío Armando is in the back. Uh, let's see, second. In second from the left, I guess, um, standing behind this beautiful young lady in a plaid shirt, making googly eyes at Ricardo Favela. That is my mother. That is Clara Sid. Um, and it's just a, a great snapshot into, you know, this is the group, right? Uh, next slide. This is another slide. Um, from what my mom has told me, this was... Uh, them, the RCAF group at, at a local TV station where Louis the Foot uh, read um, a poem that had, I guess, some, some unsavory <laughs> uh, language in it. And he was actually uh, pulled off the air and they, they weren't allowed to you know, finish the poem. But this is them sitting with Tomas Ibarra Frausto. He's there with the, that fancy mustache. Um, and this is just, you know, a wonderful picture. We, we really enjoy seeing pictures like this of, of the family of RCAF, um, just the collective, the collaboration that was always apparent and, and threaded through everything that the RCF did. They were there together. Next slide. In 1969, um, dad had enrolled at California uh, State University in Sacramento, right? So he went to CSU at Sac State. And at that time, um, they had hired, or they had not yet hired on, but um, at the time, a friend of his, Mike Medina, was talking about him to uh, one of his friends, right, which happened to be Esteban Villa, and Esteban happened to get uh, a position on as, as an instructor there at Sac State. My dad would tell these stories of um, how they came to be, how they came to meet up, and uh, during a Cinco de Mayo celebration, I believe it was, um, Jose Montoya was there on a fellowship um, try, in, in the efforts to get his master's degree. And so he was there at Sac State doing a brief presentation on the significance of Cinco de Mayo and then also um, to read some poems. At the time, my dad felt very disconnected. Um, I think if you're a person of color in the world of academia, you feel very isolated at times because oftentimes you don't see people that look like you in your classes. And this, this was especially true during that time in the, the late 1960s, early 70s, um, where he threw himself wholeheartedly into his work in ceramics. He actually had his um, 
BA. He got his BA in 1971, and he was in pursuit of his master's degree in ceramics. Um, at that time, during this celebration, he overheard uh, Jose Montoya reading his famous poem, uh, La Jefita and Los Vatos. And to dad, it just it resonated to him because he felt that he was listening to something outright straight out of his life. Um, and because of that, he felt compelled to find this man at some point and meet him. Um, because I think when you're in the world of academics and you feel like you don't belong or you haven't found your people yet, um, you're always looking. You're always looking for them. So a few months after this, um, as a matter of fact, he, Mike Medina, did introduce him to Esteban Villa. And he says the first words that Esteban said to him was, orale. And that's when he knew that they were just, he's like, that was it. That was the connection. Um, they went on to talk, have many discussions of art organizing, um, organizing the Centro de Artistas, um, different rallies they wanted to do you know, more political artwork, and they actually drew a lot of inspiration from one another. Um, shortly after he met Jose, uh, Villa, he did meet Jose Montoya, and, and that was it. Next slide. Here he is with the poster that has become um, one of his more well-known posters, the Centro de Artistas, uh, which I believe was created in 1971. He actually took off from his path of education when he met Jose and Esteban because he felt compelled to pursue his work in, in civil rights in, Chicano, um, in the Chicano movement, um, working with the UFW. And so he separated from his path of being a ceramicist and getting his master's in that program um, and, and developed you know, this beautiful space where artists could come together and, and create work as a collaboration, as a collaborative group to affect uh, change. Next slide, please. This is another uh, well-known picture, uh, something that I love to see because, you know, they were the Royal Chicano Air Force. You know, they started off as a rebel Chicano art front that got confused with the Royal Canadian Air Force. And so that's when they, of course, there was humor as well known um, in the community of Sacramento that, you know, they would take things and just run with it. So they became the Royal Chicano Air Force. Um, and so this picture is taken in front of Safeway. Uh, for the, the story that I remember from this one is that he, they joined um, some sort of route on their way to go getting drinks for the silkscreen run that they were doing. And somehow, it, I don't know, it turned into like a parade, I guess they were in. And he says they got third place in this parade. So next slide, please. This is something that I feel I remember very well. All of these faces are very familiar to me. Louis the Foot, Juan Cervantes, Rudy Cario that had the coolest mustache ever. He was part of Trio Casindo with Jose Montoya. Um, you have Max Garcia, Esteban Villa, and Daniel de los Reyes. Um, and this was at one of their art shows. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite pieces of my father's. It's, it's a large wooden piece that is hanging up there in the Ars Visalia show. Um, he passed away July 15, 2007. Um, he was actually in Dainuba at the time. Um, he was attending his, his sister's um, surprise birthday party. It was 77, 70th, I can't remember. Um, but he was there for that and you know he passed away while he was there. He always said he wanted to be buried in Dainuba and my mom, you know, funny story, she would always refuse, like, I'm not taking your body over there. But he got his way. He passed away there and he's buried there at uh, Smith Cemetery. And um, this is a picture of his headstone. And it actually has um, a drawing um, etched in, in the stone uh, that he did that we thought was pretty appropriate and pretty badass, if I do say so myself. Uh, next slide, I think the next person to uh, to speak is going to be Josephine Talamantes, my tia. Oh, one more slide. I'm, apologies. Uh, 
we were lucky enough to have the honor of celebrating him March 5th, uh, 20, 2020, I believe. And the city of Sacramento recognized a small little patch of land as a park um, dedicated to him. So there is a park in Sacramento uh, called the Ricardo Favela Park here and um, in the community of East Sacramento. It was a, a huge honor. Uh, we had several speakers there. We had a lot of family and friends in attendance. And um, that is a picture of, of our family up at the top. Nice. Up. All right. Your turn, Thea. All right, here we go. Hi, everybody. All right, so um, I found a number of um, images of Armando's work that I thought I would share with you all tonight. Ricardo and Armando were cuñados. And um, anyway, so here's some of our pictures. Um, let me go back a bit. I'm, I'm getting a little confused. Okay, so here you go. So this is uh, um, RCF goes to college and I'm sorry that some of my slides are blurry, but um, that's what I have. Uh, this is one of the last photographs, all of them, all of them were together. <laughs> and I, there's um, Stan Padilla, Juan Cervantes, Ricardo, Jose, Esteban, Juan Carrillo, um, I, I can't see, okay, there you go. All right, there you go. Uh, Rudy Collar, um, Manuel Carrillo, Sam wow. Rios, Lorraine Garcia, Juanishi, and Armando. This is a piece that uh, Tere Romo identified at the Smithsonian. It's part of uh, Tomas Ibarra Fausto's donation of slides and posters to the Smithsonian. This one's called Tar Tardiada con Cesar Chavez seriograph. And then here's Cesar talking. Oops, sorry, this thing is very sensitive. You see the poster right here in the front of his podium. This Muchisimas Gracias a la Ciudad seriograph. This is his master's um, poster at Benny Barrios Gallery. This is, this is a photograph from that time of his master's. Um, these are some earlier works of his. This is an oil painting, Mujer. He always did a lot of um, round body figures. I couldn't find any of his ceramics because, and I think David Rasul I'll have to get some slides of those pieces, but um, he always did round bodies. So these, las soldaderas. So this one is a multimedia seriograph. This is his mother's green card. And this is Armando, he inserted himself. This is his family. This is his mother, his grandmother, and uh, he inserted himself in there. And I'll tell you a quick story. His mother saw the piece and she was like, she was outraged that he had put her green card <laughs> into a piece of artwork. This is from an exhibition he did a while back, Tacos y Otras Cosas, seriograph. He was an avid fisherman um, and he, him and his brothers were always um, in fishing competitions. So this is uh, one that they won. Oops. So this is a, a piece uh, that he did in 1975. It's a tile mosaic. And uh, this, pe this piece actually um, was done by the Sacramento Housing Commission, but they had to figure out a way to administer the funds. And so it was the impetus that started the Metropolitan Arts Commission. Um, this piece is still there. There's a few pieces that are starting to uh, um, fall off and 
we have to talk about restoring it, but it's very difficult to get those tile, those little tile pieces. So he did this with assistant Junior Baca and a lot of other people that helped. And then when he when he passed away in 2009, he was working to restore. This is the other side of that building. It's a it's Zapata Park, but it's a housing project, Washington housing project, and. Uh, this is a piece that he, this is his design, but he had already, he passed away in the process. So I negotiated with the Metropolitan Arts Commission to, to allow his family to restore um, this piece uh, since they had already, he had already taken down all the other tiles. And so you can tell we didn't have access to the Italian, the round Italian pieces, but we did what we could. So it was done by Ricardo's family, my family, uh, Mondo's other brother, uh, uh, Freddie's family, all of the kids, um, and then friends. Chico Gonzalez helped, and uh, another friend of mine, Pineapple, and then uh, just a lot of other people were coming and going. So we did this uh, a year after he passed away, and uh, it was installed uh, in August of 2010. Again, kind of blurry. This is the Reno Club mural, the backside. This one is the short hold, and this is a multimedia watercolor. And I, I didn't know what it was called, but it's that reflective tape that a lot of uh, 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 lowrider bicycle kids put on their 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 motors their bicycles when they're souping them up. So this is all this is all kind of reflective tape in here that he did, and then he and then it um, it was watercolor. This is a uh, one one part of a trip triptych that he did El Beso, so you can see it. it's got two other pieces on the on the sides of it. This is a watercolor coyote on Arches paper. This is flying flying Chile. RCF con ratoncito. This one was done in 1988. He actually has a date on it. Uh, Agua, Corazón y Chile. This one was done for an exhibition up in Auburn. This is Mondo Studio. You can see all his work in the, in the back. I was uh, interviewing all the RCA of artists at one point, looking forward to an exhibition of their work. So I have pretty much a lot of documentation. This is him at State Fair. I worked for the Arts Council for many years and we, we, we would go to the State Fair um, and he volunteered to help us do, do some artwork and screening. And this is him with his mask making workshops. Mondo did a lot of work with the, um, the Cultural Affairs Committee and the Breakfast for Ninos uh, and, and they were the ones, he was very involved in the um, development of Dia de los Muertos. And so he would always, every year he'd do workshops on uh, mass making. So this one jumped pretty quick, or maybe a, there's, he's working with a little girl taking off her, her mask. So he was always in the community doing all kinds of work. This one is uh, Calavera Trilogy, it's paper mache. Calavera con alas y corazón, a lot of paper mache. Calavera man. This one, this one is a series of a, a whole number of different little calaveritas that he did, and they're they're just hilarious. Crazy bird. This one is part of the private collection of UC Davis. That's the other part of it. This is uh, Pajara con Botas y Wheels, <laughs> paper mache. This is Salsa, it's a paper mache, private collection of Clara Cid. And 
And this is an altar installation that he did. It's huge. This piece is so huge. And you could see, you know, it's all connected together. You put the whole thing together and the legs can go straight. They can go down. They can curl up. It's, it's a really fun piece. And you could see the altar. These are little calaveritas that he, that he would do. Little angels and devils. And he was always doing something. This is Zapata con agua. This is a, a, a piece that he did, acrylic on wood. It was also part of that, uh, an exhibition that was up in Auburn. It was funny, the whole exhibition was about water and he collaborated with another artist, a friend of ours, and she makes these water fountains. And, and, and it was so funny because it had rained really hard and the whole place got flooded. <laughs> And they had to put caution tape all the way around. It was hilarious. Anyway, Mondo was a master printmaker. And so uh, this is this is a really old piece um, that I still have in, here in my house. I took a photograph of it, Amor. Lionel cut, Madre. He would do cards and prints and all kinds of different pieces. This is an altar that he did for his mother, Clara Sid, in 2008. This was the year before he passed. It was uh, kind of a sad three years. Uh, 2007, my brother-in-law Favela passed away. The following year, 2008, my mother-in-law passed away. And then in 2009, Armando passed away. But he did, he did all the work. He, everything you see there, that's his work. It's a little kind of close up. He, he even carved this Teponashli. He did all of these calaveras. Uh, this print up here of his mother, he, he built these little, little, uh, this, uh, I'll go back so you could see the, uh, these, this is paper mache Virgen de Guadalupe. So anyway, yeah, he was always, he was always working. This is a, a piece that he did back in the seventies for Dia de los Muertos. And it still, it still is part of Dia de los Muertos every year this year. This is a coffin that we put the, the piece inside the coffin, carry it through the cemetery, through the processions. Yeah, is that the piece that was in that, um, the picture um, yes. from the, one of the first ones? So that's still, that's the same paper mache piece? Yes, we just dressed oh, okay. it up. You can see he's okay. deteriorating, but he's still, he's still out there. <laughs> This is there it of, is. This yeah no this is a different. No, that's piece. not the same one. Okay. Yeah, this is a different piece, but th this is a uh, another piece. Yeah, there's Armando, Eli, Rico, and my mother-in-law, Rosemary, Rasul, and uh, Dia de los Muertos. <laughs> I you know, I think I jumped probably quickly. I'm not looking at. I'm sorry to do this, but I was looking for the. No, nope, that's okay. I'll, I'll work with it later. Anyway, that's what I have sharing his wonderful work and his life. He was very involved uh, with Dia de los Muertos and, and there he is just having fun. So there, I'll turn it <laughs> over to Richard Montoya. You're on brother. Oh no. Uh, welcome. All right. Am I heard? Yeah. A yes. Little louder, be great. All right. Everyone's. Let's see. Sound like my dad right now. All right. I got... <laughs> How does goddamn Zoom work? Son of a Jose Matoya. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm late to the party. We were. Um... Hey, hi, Moy Moy. Kianjin there, sister, and. Uh daughter of Jose and myself and uh, we're in film production right now and I'm in Culver City on a soundstage but uh, really happy to uh, to check in uh, with the familia and with this beautiful show I was on a panel yesterday at, at Teatro panel um, and uh, I brought up the Ricardo show uh, seen and unseen and um Hi, Lupe. <laughs> I feel like a huggy boy right now. Okay, we're going to take some dedications here. A couple of <laughs> seconds here. And, uh, um, I don't think that I submitted 
too many slides, but um, um, just listening to you all, um, complete like Armando's tiles and this show and Visalia, all the work that the family and the curators have done. Sometimes those are the same people and and even getting Jose's retrospective Abundant Harvest done at UCLA, we're, what's so touching to me and what I think that Ricardo would be so proud of his children and Clara and this idea that we are, that it's up to the familias, it's up to us to get them across that finish line. You know, Cesar used to say, because Cesar, we met through the RCF, but when the RCF used to do security for Cesar and, you know, at UC Davis, there's, you know, a man with a gun on top of a building, Ricardo, Louis, those guys ran to that direction. They got Cesar off the stage. That's the other thing the RCF did. And, and Favela didn't mess around, you know, and Louis the Foot, if there was a Cholo with a butcher knife at Southside Park, Louis went for the knife and got it out of their hands. They, they took Cesar's nonviolent message to heart. There were some brown berets and different people that didn't get the memo, no knives, no guns. It usually was up to the RCF to remove the weapons from the union hall, from the dance, from the park. And, uh, but, but back to my point about getting these men across the finish line, because Cesar would say, you know, we're always in a rush to, to get there. It doesn't matter when you get there. It only matters that you get there. And I feel like Ricardo has gotten there in Visalia. That's why the, Benedict, the, the marches were, were developed. It would take 30 days to march to Sacra, you know, 30 days from Delano. And the movement, Cesar knew that he literally needed to see a movement, bodies, people moving in the marches. So if it took 30 days to get to Sacra, it took 30 days, but you got there. If, if, if since 2007 to now, if it took that long to get Ricardo show up, it, it, we got there. You got you, Tina, brothers and sisters, and, and your mom, and the SIDS, the curators, you all got Ricardo across the finish line. And that is so gratifying. That is, I know that there's sometimes sadness in working with these shows. There's sadness in talking about Armando. There's sadness about talking about Jose. But there's also a great deal of joy in this, in this artwork and great joy in getting getting these shows open and, and all that these men did. You know, I can hear your father's voice, his laugh, his, you know, I can hear Armando's husky voice. I can hear Jose's regañado or his laugh as well. <laughs> and, and the ability to laugh and to be pranksters and, and Mary, they, they, they made they made mirth. They they made the Teamsters look silly. They made they routed cops. They 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 um with their joy and with their humor, they made they made violence look foolish. And and I think that's why when Cesar came to Sacra, his hair was down. Cesar loved, loved hanging with these guys. It wasn't like having to be with lawyers, God bless the lawyers. It wasn't, you know, there's always a picture of Cesar smiling with the RCF. And, and, I, and I believe it was, it was precisely that ability that these men had to, to be serious and be intellectuals, but the, uh, the ability to laugh. This, this photo, they commandeered that Jeep, by the way. That was not, you know, and, 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 and where they got the Jeep and, and just, what tells you so much is who's in the car. You know, we talk a lot like, hey, who's in the car? Look who's in the car, <laughs> you know? And, and um, I love that more than anyone, Favela sat with the intellectuals, sometimes ran the table, ran the conversation, 
listen to Villa, listen to Montoya, and then and then when push came to shove, you could you could go to Ricardo. He was an intellectual, and I've made that point several times, and that we we need to embrace that. And then later in academic, you know, and and still an RCF member, and it's so three dimensionalized. I remember one time I'll share a quick story. Um, Somehow I ended up in the car, like many of you did, like my brother Mel and Vincent ended up in the car and they ended up in Milwaukee with our CF. My mom thought they went to the store around the corner. Like, where's, <laughs> where's, Vin, where's Vincent and Mel? They're in Milwaukee. With, you know, they drove half the way there. And uh, so we're, we're on our way to uh, Fresno and uh, gonna go hang out with Ernie Palomino. Rocha del Valle and, and uh, Magu and and uh, so we're on our way to Fresno and we stop at this diner and I get to sit at the table with Via, my dad and, and Ricardo. I think I think Eli and Rick, they were, the other guys were at the other table and and the waitress came over and I think I was like sixteen or seventeen and kind of made goo goo eyes at the at the waitress, which I shouldn't have done. And the, the cook was on the other side of the window, kept staring at me. And Favela's like, I don't know how you pissed off the cook, man, but he's staring at you. And I looked over and this guy is staring death rays at me. <laughs> and Favela's like, hey, what do you want us to tell your mom, you know, when he kills you? What do you want us to do? <laughs> and I'm like, Mo, and I'm like, Mo, you gotta help me. He goes, hey, hey, you gotta get yourself out of this, you know? And my dad and Via weren't even listening to me, but like th this, this cook was gonna kill me. Uh, for being making goo goo eyes, probably at his at his old lady who was serving us, he did not appreciate that. And 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 Favela had the best time to say, "Hey, he's he's gonna come over here. He's gonna, he's gonna kill me." <laughs> I'm like like Favela, you got my back. You're gonna walk me out of here. Hey, hey, hey. Favela's like, "Hey, hey, hey, little Dick. Hey, Dick, you're on your own, Dick." And, and he's like, "Hey, Jose, your son's in trouble. Ah, get, pay the bill, Richard." And I'm like. Don't leave me here. This guy's gonna kill me. <laughs> Tattoos, and I was like scared to death. And he he got such a kick, you know, out of like. And sure enough, man, Mo went over there, gave the guy a tip at the window. Hey, the chamaco didn't mean nothing. You know, a little misunderstanding. You know? and I think I peed my pants, man, and I was like, but but Mo laughed all the way to and back from Fresno. And I just loved, like, he was just like, hey, what, what do you want us to tell your mom? Cause uh, you know, I think this is, I think this is curtains for you. <laughs> and uh, that, 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 that humor and, and uh, that joy of living and, and, you know, with danger never too far away, you know, that we forget that with Cesar and the movement, Brown Berets, the, the Black Panthers are coming from Oakland to sit down with the Berets of Sakura. Who was at the fucking table, man? It was it was all of our dads and some of our moms and people. And they brokered peace. They brokered peace that day with, with the Panthers downtown. And I, I remember a cloudy day. And we got a call at our house and someone said, hey, Mary, uh, Jose wants you to get the 22, you know, out of the closet, you know, just put it on the table. We're like little kids, like, and we just knew we couldn't go out and play because something was going down and my mom had the 22 pistol on the table. And and uh, before we knew it, Favela, Rico, there were a few guys outside the house. And we were like, we were just different than other kids because all the other kids were outside playing. We That day we couldn't go outside and play, but it, it got very serious at times because what was happening was the, the Panthers were fighting for their children's school lunch and the Berets were fighting for their children's school lunch. And of course the, the barrio and the ghetto were getting peanuts and they were going at it. And, and it took Bobby Seale, you know, to come to Sacra and sit with, you know, many people, including members of the RCF to broker a kind of a peace. And those moments I'm very proud of because it showed the Black Brown Coalition was Although fitful at times, there were times it, it, it came together and it unified. And at that time, there were um, these beautiful black men that were the security detail for Cesar Chavez, the Delancey Street uh, folks, and uh, Archie Moore, the great boxer, and 
And so it was an incredible time. We'll never see another era quite like that. And it makes me sad to say that we really may not see artists like, like Favela and, and Montoya and, and, and Sid. And, and so we, um, this art show, Seen and Unseen, uh, is incredibly important. And I just, I just can't give my love and my appreciation to, to, the, to the Familia for getting your father, your husband, the son of his mother across that finish line in such beautiful, beautiful fashion. I know how difficult it is and uh, you have done a world-class job. The, the art community from here to the East Coast, people are watching, people are aware of it and it's high time. And um, there's really no one as deserving as uh, Ricardo and you have so much to be to be proud of. And um, I think I'll leave it right there. Thank you, Richard. Um, I, the only thing I'll say, I, you know, there were a lot of slides I didn't put in for Armando, but um, uh, Tere uh, wrote in the chat uh, with regard to the piece at the La Raza bookstore that he did that was Montoya and other people, but uh, I didn't have the slides, so I couldn't put it in. But Mondo, Mondo would, uh, and I think Ricardo had a lot of sketch books. Montoya had a lot of sketch books. Mondo didn't have a whole lot of sketch books because he went from his mind to the paper. And I asked him one day, where's your sketch books? He goes, he said to me, well, I, you know, I have a few, but I, I basically see it in my head. And especially if he was doing printmaking because he would go from his head to the piece, but he had to reverse the piece in order to um, carve it on the lino cut so that when you put the paper on it, it comes out and it's the, it's the reverse. But, um, and you know, Ricardo carried a lot of sketchbooks, Montoya, Villa, they all carried sketchbooks. Mondo didn't carry sketchbooks. You know, Thea, one of my um, my favorite things about all three of these wonderful men that we're talking about is um, the fact that they're so community driven. Uh, I remember from when we were very small going to Dia de los Muertos celebrations and doing plaster masks. And, and I love that Asusena, his daughter, right, um, is now carries that tradition um, and teaches workshops every time Dia de los Muertos comes around. Um, body art was around for over 35 years, um, you know, before dad's passing. And he took that over from Jose. Um, that was a beautiful program that was just entrenched in the community. And it went from working with little kids to, you know, the ancianos, to danzantes, to mural projects. I mean, just it encompassed so many things um, that was so beautiful. And, um, and that's what I feel like, you know, the RCF was about as a collaborative group, right? They were cultural workers working for, for working to affect change. And the way you do that is by engaging your community. And that was just a really beautiful thing to see throughout this, you know, the 20 some odd years at the time, you know, by the time my dad had his In Search of Mr. Gonzalo's um, master's show that he had, you know, captured 21 plus years of, you know, affecting change through through art, through political artwork. And he even said himself that he had a hard time getting back into the master's program after he came back um, from his hiatus and, and working um, for the Centro de Artistas and, 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 you know, organizing all that kind of stuff that, you know, he was told that his artwork was too political. You know, like I can't even imagine someone saying that now, um, but anyways. I think that's a good point, you know, that um, the way in which a lot of the artwork was uh, always called political, but yet we still fight the same fights, even though they're gone. Even though it's been from, you know, before the 60s, you know, and uh, um, that's just amazing to me. And the same, the same, uh, 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 response to, well, there's not enough uh, qualified professors. 
or there's not enough qualified graduate students, you know, or we're, we're just, you're just not good enough. So I think really what happened, what, what, what I, the lesson I, I see here all the time over and over and over again is, is uh, you just express yourself and express yourself in the way that we know how through a Chicano land, through a, you know, through a multicultural, use anything you have, you know? And so I think that if you look at, because somebody asked, what is the most famous uh, print of the RCAF and why is it famous? I think they're all famous and they're all killer and everybody had their own specific, you know, uh, perspective of life, you know? I think about uh, Juan Cervantes, the most unassuming Chicano artist, but the baddest, you know, I mean, he was killer. Max Garcia, who was colorblind, <laughs> but he was a, uh, he could, uh, you know, he had a vision of what he wanted to see. Max lived with me a long time and he used to draw and he used to be making these posters constantly, constantly from ideas and laughing and laughing and laughing. And, and then he gets serious and he'd be that intellectual, be cr uh, social critic. What was happening in society? And then Max would always say, well, what happened to the love? What about love? And in the show, there's that beautiful mural, you know, by, uh, by another Cervantes. It says, love with the rose. The, 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 you know, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. It's funny you say that because Mondo was colorblind too. I was going to oh, wow. say. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, I read, um, my dad had this insert that I found from, it's a letter from Cesar Chavez, uh, October, dated October 20th, 1989. And I love that he put in there, um, he was congratulating, you know, um, on this 20 plus year run of um, political activism and art activism. And he wrote that, you know, the RCAF, you've created not for art's sake, but for peace and justice's sake. And I just thought that was so beautiful because when you look at those posters, you know, you'll see the typography and you'll see what it's actually advertising. And it's all, you know, it's all about the community. It's all about, you know, there's, there's purpose, there's intention to all of this artwork. And um, it's just, and it's, and it's so impressive to see when you see it at the show at Arts Visalia um, on the wall, you know, the stretch of these, these beautiful colors and these, these beautiful events that were put on um, and promoted. But they were all about community. Um, and Mondo, Mondo tells a story that when he he came out of the military, uh, well, actually, when he was in the in the military, you know how they do the R and R, uh, they get a break, right? He was during the Vietnam War, but they get a break. So he took himself to uh, Paris and he rented a bike and he started going to all the museums and. I don't know where else he went, but he, he said he said that he he knew he wanted to be an artist. Um, and when he saw the museum, it solidified it. So he said he came back to uh, Sacramento and then he decided he was going to go to law school and he went I mean law school art school. And he he decided to um, go to uh, College of Art and Design because at that time it wasn't in Pasadena. It was over on the west side of L.A. And so he takes his portfolio and he goes to the college and he said, okay, I'm ready to sign up for classes. <laughs> and they looked at him and they said, uh, did you apply? <laughs> he looked at him and he said, well, I've got my portfolio here. I'm ready to start. And you know, it's really funny. They, they took his portfolio, they looked through his portfolio and they admitted him. Uh, but they told him normally people apply a year in advance. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he, you know, and he was working as a, as a LA, um, LA Times, you know, uh, uh, night editor. So he's on the bus going from East LA to downtown to his classes with all this stuff. And then uh, um, he said one day he walks out of his Thea's house. He had gone to have uh, uh, breakfast at his Thea's house. He walks out and then all the marches for, um, for um, the Chicano uh, moratorium were walking by so he just he just joined them and he said after that he's they were you know he he was part of the whole march and then he said i'm going back to sacramento 
<laughs> and then he goes back to Sacramento, hooks up with, you know, Jose Favela and, and uh, Stevan. So, um, but, you know, he, 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 he did go to Art Center College of, of Design. And that's the same place that uh, Max went. But, but when Max went, I believe, I don't know if it was still on the west side or they had already moved to Pasadena, but he, he then goes uh, to Pasadena, you know, Max went to Art Center College of Design as well. I think it was uh, on the west side when Max went, because then Max left to get involved in the Vietnam War demonstrations. And actually Max was, was, uh, was, was on the organizing committee of the big uh, anti-war march in San Francisco that was, that's been, it's a famous one. It was a huge one. And Max was involved in helping organize that, but he left, you know, a school. He also went to UCLA to, to take our classes. So yeah, he was on the website. Yeah. Oh, I, I was trying to catch Richard, but he disconnected. I think they want, somebody wants to hear um, a repeat of, of the Black Panthers. So if he comes back on, somebody mention it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, I think uh, uh, what is interesting too now is that uh, all the murals that are going up in Sacramento, walls wide open, but it was really the RCAF who was the, uh, you know, who, who started all that, who started the murals. And, and it's funny to me how Southside Park was back in the heyday, I mean, back in the, the day was like a wino park and then they painted the mural and then all of a sudden it, it became a space for, you know, for gathering and all those tardiadas, man, in the 70s and into the 80s, the ones that the RCAF did, but Los Lobos there, all the music, man, all the, all those where people would come from all over. People come from all over California just to go to Southside Park to one of the tardiadas. Yeah, for Ceremonia también, for Ceremonia our, our Danzantes. Chu right. Ortiz, Maria Miranda, yeah, all the grupos yeah. that are there, they come up from all over the state. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so culturally, you know, because somebody asked about the cultural centers, I think that uh, um, culturally Sacramento, because this has been said a lot, is because it's a capital and because you got the political thing happening there. But what the RCAF did was definitely ground this Chicano cultural thing you know, Dia de los Muertos, the danzantes, the murals, the cartelones, the art classes. Things were happening there in Sacramento that were, that were uh, I think you said it, Josie, they were avant-garde. They, the, they were the true pioneers. And, the, and the, I think that we talked about uh, last week of, uh, with the Rosa del Valle, the relationship with the artists from San Diego and LA and San Francisco and from Seattle, Washington, and then and then the ones in Chicago and you know all these people, even Texas, Arizona, they would all, you know, have links to Sacramento and vice versa. So I think that's something that um, doesn't really get talked about as much, and really doesn't happen as much as it used to happen. Well, I think back to the Danzantes, since you mentioned them, I mean, basically Mama Cobb uh, was, was a mentee of Florencio Yescas, who, who right. really brought five uh, Azteca Splendores here to California that then kind of branched out in different ways um, uh, throughout the Southwest. And um, she, was, she was my teacher as a Danzante, you know, starting at DQU. And then, and she's still doing a lot of, um, you know, traje making and, uh, you know, she's elderly now, but uh, she's donated to the Chicano Park Museum, which we, once we get it open and get the archive going, she has donated to us one of uh, Florencio Yesca's trajes. So it'll be on display along with uh, some Azcleca, who was another one from uh, Sacramento, I mean, from down here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with her, you know, Chewy took the stance of becoming a danzante and, you know, wow. he, 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 um, when he came back from the longest march, when he came back from the longest march, he, he just used his um, danza and did that until he died. 
Yeah. He was a great yeah. spiritual advisor to my dad. They, they had yeah. a lot of, a lot of chats um, connected very deeply on, on many levels. I miss him. Yeah. And I, I think uh, one thing I'm thinking about uh, is uh, because of, you know, uh, we talk about community business and, and all our communities, there's so much happening right now that just it's in the paper, but it's not in the paper, but it's in our communities. And one thing uh, uh, we talked about it a little bit, but mental health, you know, la cultura cura, you know, and, and the, even that concept was so ingrained into Sacramento, you know, um, with with uh, Dr. Solis, you know, and, and, and how all that stuff really uh, took root and people ran with it. And now that's a very common phrase, la cultura cura. You know, yeah. and so, uh, and there has been other groups that have formed the, uh, using that concept and, you know, and, and of course they flourish, not only in California, but all over the Southwest and made the connection to Mexico. So, I mean, that's something that, that uh, definitely the RCAF had a big impact on and still does, you know. I think somebody's asking what the point of our presentation is tonight. And the whole focus of this is Ricardo Favela, who was one of the co-founders of the Royal Chicano Air Force and um, mentioning these other people. The RCAF um, was broader than just the visual artists. There were musicians, there were dancers, there were community workers, there were poets, there were writers, there were um, as Jose would say, derelict dogs among them, you mm -hmm. know. And so it, it, when you try to talk about the RCEF, um, and in particular Ricardo, you, you, it's hard to just talk about him without talking about, you know, everything else that was going on during the height of the Chicano uh, civil rights movement. The, the RCEF, you know, you talk, you know, um, talk about La Raza Bookstore. Eddie started mm -hmm. talking about that tonight, which um, Pike and uh, Philip Santos and Dede Romo really, you know, led the way on that. Um, That's right, Dede. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and so, and I, you know, I worked, uh, when I came back to, um, to Sacramento as well, the second time I worked at La Raza Bookstore as well. But um, back to the description of the RCAF, I think I think what I what you were referring to, Eddie, is what I shared is that they were avant-garde before avant-garde was in vogue. Um, they were doing multidisciplinary work uh, way back when. And sometimes, you know, I worked at the California Arts Council for close to 28 years and or close to 30 years. But um, I remember some of those early panels and they, you know, a lot of times they, you know, they wanted the artists to just show their full body of work, but these artists were doing interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and installation work and folk art. They were in, they were including all of that into their work. So it was hard for, you know, purists to to a certain degree to understand what they were doing. I mean, it's not a difficult thing these days because a lot of people do uh, multidisciplinary work. Um, but in those times, um, these guys were out there. They were in incorporating community at all level. Um, I, I would say that um, all the things that they were doing at that time, uh, they were ahead of their time because all of all of what they were doing is relevant today, especially today. Um, Absolutely. And, and so um, I, I guess that's a kind of a short answer to this person's question of what the point of this discussion is. The whole focus is, is, re, is uh, surrounding uh, the exhibition Seen and Unseen, focusing on uh, Ricardo Jesus uh, Favela, but um, also in this show is, is the posters of the RCAF. So it, it becomes a broader discussion. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Go ahead, Tina. Oh, I was going to say part of, uh, part of the, the more beautiful uh, aspects, I feel, of the RCAF's legacy is, uh, you know, one of the things that really impressed upon dad was the concept of mentorship, um, the concept of the interpersonal relationships that you would have with your students. One of the things that really blew him away when he was at Sac State um, in, the, in the early 70s and late 60s um, was the fact that, you know, Esteban and Jose readily admitted to their students that they took 
inspiration from them, that they were inspired by their students, that they that they had a hard time learning how to even silkscreen print because you know they asked around to different shops and the shops wouldn't tell them and wouldn't give them the information. So they had to kind of muck through it and they had to figure it out themselves. And from there they taught, you know, and so those seeds have been planted all over. And I think one of my dad's um, more profound legacies has been um, his ability to connect with his students, to plant those seeds of knowledge and inspiration of Chicanismo um, and to see the fruits of that labor now, you know, and unfortunately he's gone, but, you know, to see it sprout up in the Soul Collective and Estela Sanchez, to see it sprout up in his children, in Chico Gonzalez and Manuel Fernando Rios and Joao Santian. So there are so many people that were touched, you know, um, Yaya Porras, Nicole Limon, all these beautiful people that were influenced um, by his teachings. And, and part of the way that you get influenced um, is by those personal connect connections, right? And he was a, a wonderful, beautiful people person. Um, he used to drive us nuts as little kids. We go to art shows and we would have ran around seven times, eight times. And, you know, three hours later, we're still there and he's still talking to anybody that wants to talk to him. It would drive us crazy. <laughs> you know, we'd get home super late because dad wouldn't stop talking. But, you know, he felt obligated to speak to anyone and everyone that wanted to, to approach him with any kind of questions about art. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was all about um, the next generation. And Mom yeah, was absolutely. always... Mondo was always about um, collecting art and supplies and everything. Mm -hmm. he, was gonna, he was gonna reopen another centro, you know. So what happened? I took up the gauntlet and now we're doing the Chicano Park That's Museum right. and Cultural Center. That's <laughs> so right, yeah. <laughs> <out. laughs> you know, I, I wanna real fast uh, a shout out because you talked about the book, so we uh, mentioned her name, but Tere, uh, Tere Romo, who, who took off with from from Sacramento and kept on going with her art history or, or her curating and even writing now. And, and there's a show at the Smithsonian, you know, printing the revolution that she that she was involved in. So so the 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 roots of the art they have, yeah, they're they're in a lot of they have a lot of tentacles. They're they're flowering in a lot of ways from San Diego you know, to uh, up north, uh, further than Sacramento. And so that's really, and you're right. Um, one thing, because uh, uh, Ricardo, man, we go places and I'm a talker, he's a talker. We never got out. We laugh and laugh and laugh. And I remember we went to San Francisco one time uh, to the Mexican mu uh, Museum and we took Maggie with us, Margarita, uh, Favela's oldest daughter. And uh, we get over there and I think I saw uh uh, some people I knew, I know, I saw some people I knew, I, I went over and started talking to them. And uh, I remember I came back to them uh, about an hour later and, and Maggie goes, you, why are you talking to everyone? Oh, you know, what's up with this guy? He's talking to everybody, you know? And so we laughed, Mo and I laughed, they laughed, they laughed. Cause, you know, that's just how it is when, you know, I think they call it now, which cracks me up, but about, you know, uh, Holy Spirit, make a community. We have a community. We have a deep community. We have deep connections. I showed you, you know, I was thinking about this. Uh, um, Richard is not here, but he's making a film on Chavez Ravine. I showed you that picture of my mom and dad. My mom was born in Palo Verde, in Chavez Ravine. You know, my, my family's from uh, uh, Chula Vista over there by you, Josie. You know, we, we, we have these connections. My, my parents lived in Visalia, you know, right there by, by Dinuba. You know, we, we have, we, we have, we are connected in so many ways, so many ways. And the art, for me, it's just uh, really, it's like a blanket when you're cold, you know, it just warms you because it's, it's so powerful. And I don't care if it's enchiladas or tacos or chicken molded bones or art on the wall or, right? I mean, it's so words, music. I mean, it's, it's a lot deeper than, than we, than a lot, not we, but a lot of other people see of us. We are that we're deep, deep. I remember one time, um, um, Mondo got contacted by uh, Wayne uh, Cook, who was working at the California Arts Council, because he was part of 
an experimental project they were doing with the migrant camps and with the Tree Foundation. So um, Mondo, and there were other artists too, but I, I'm just going to describe our experience. Mondo decides to pack up the whole family and go down to to these migrant camps. It was, you know, I, I think it was over a two month period of time, and. Uh, I think it was called Sombre de Arbol or something along that line. But we get there and I, I, I asked Mondo, where are we staying? He goes, oh, we're staying in the migrant camps. Because, you know, Mar Mondo at one point was, was up in Tule Lake. He was uh, <laughs> working with the, the migrants up at Tule Lake. But anyway, he said, we're moving into the migrant camp. So we moved into the migrant camp over the weekend. And, uh, and so he had his little press and he had all his little things, you know, and he made it very simple. Art was simple. You could make art out of anything. He went to the 99 cent store. He picked up a placemat so that he could roll the ink. He picked up a cuchara, a spoon, so he could, you know, use the paper on top of the, the monoprint. And then, and, then, uh, and then he had his, his girls outside, one doing papel picado, and one doing ojos de Dios. And then he made me go to the other side and do danza azteca. So those kids were coming through the mic, you know, they, they would come through, they'd go through each work se session. What was so awesome was the next day, because it we, we went over a weekend, uh, we kept going over weekends, but the first, the first time we got there was, so it was the next day, it was Sunday morning. They were knocking on the door at like 6.30 in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning. Maestro, maestro, cuando empezamos? You know, when are we gonna start? <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> and he told them, oh, okay, we're gonna start. We're gonna start, but we're gonna start at, you know, 10.30. I need to, I need to get up. I need to shower and I need to eat breakfast first. <laughs> so he did monoprints. He had the kids go out and find twigs and all kinds of stuff and put them on a paper and, then he, you know, inked everything up and put the paper down and pulled the print, and uh, uh, it was it was. <laughs> oh my God, uh, we stayed in an empty unit, uh, so we were we they were they were there at six in the morning knocking, and they were knocking like every twenty minutes, you know, <laughs> let me in. When are we gonna do these <laughs> workshops? Anyway. Hey, there's a question um, on here uh, from Mari Barrera. What were some of the favorite moments for you in putting the show together and what memories have come up? Eddie, you want to take that one? Um, man, this is, I thought about this for a long time and I didn't know how to make it happen. And this woman that I know, she kept on telling me, Eddie, you got to do this, you got to do this. And that's, yeah, yeah. She kept on telling me, she kept on telling me. So the favorite has to be, of course, asking Lucia to write the grant and then to know that, oh my God, we got, we're going to, it's going to happen. And then it's like, Okay, so now I've already talked to Clara, but I had to talk to her again. And the other day, you know, and, and it kind of, this is really my favorite because I, I told her, she was saying about uh, this and that. I said, Clara, you, you didn't really think this was going to happen. And then she was real serious. She goes, no, I really didn't. And I said, it, it's not only going to happen, it's happening. And that was, that was a favorite part, but more than anything is the way that this show has grown in so many different ways and touched so many people, helped so many people understand who they are and what they are and, 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 and give, you know, give cues to, from the farm workers to the intellectuals to the regular people, hearing those students talk about oh, wow, I didn't know that. Or my father used to tell me that. My grandfather used to tell me that. Just the, the way that this show has touched people, I can, that's, that's for me. That's, I, I will add to that, you know, putting these slides together for Mondo's work. And I didn't have a lot of, I'm, I'm in, 
I live between San Diego and Sacramento. So I, I'm in San Diego looking, trying to find slides and to put together at least some, some presentation of the different art forms that he worked in. And I got to tell you, Mondo passed away going on 11 years now. And um, it was probably the hardest thing that I've done in 10 years because I'm, I'm a good one for denial. I keep my head in the sand, you know. <laughs> Um, I, I know he's gone, but I don't, I don't deal with that kind of stuff very well. So um, all I can say is going through these slides was pretty uh, challenging uh, as I looked at him. And then when I looked at images of him and, um, you know, well, I got through it, but um, that was the hardest part. And, and what I like the most about this show is um, the different platicas you've been having, um, um, the virtual uh, accessibility so that people uh, can see the show from anywhere. And um, I really loved the conversation with the COS students and the high school students because for me, that was, that was uh, most important because that's what Ricardo would have liked the most. Oh, yeah. I think that's what uh, all of the RCAF would have liked the most. I know Armando would have liked that the most because they were pretty awesome. I agree, I agree. Um, you know, I read someplace in an interview with my dad that he said the whole purpose of Chicano life is to regain balance. Um, and I think that's what we all struggle for, right? And so, when we had those students um, in the ethnic study class or the students um, in Visalia talking about ethnic studies, that um, was such a beautiful thing because when you go through school and you go through academics and it's from a, a Eurocentric lens and you're struggling to find and re find relevancy to your life and you're struggling to kind of come into your own as it is, it's so profound to be able to see um, elders who have done this before you and to know that they're out there and to know that it's still possible that it's cyclical that we continue to um, seek out uh, these teachings and this knowledge and the validation you feel when you find it I think that's um, something that I know my dad really identified with and, and you could see it when those students were talking and it was just such a beautiful thing to witness Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you for sharing. And we really did uh, do our best to to honor the legacy and the the spirit of, of Mr. Favela uh, in everything that we did and the platicas and and having you all here has been uh, such a pleasure. Um, uh, our time is done, but we don't have to rush off. But I do want to at least uh, thank our sponsors again. And COS has been wonderful. We couldn't actually have the event in COS. Can you put the the back for just a, a minute, please? The last slide at the at the bottom there, you see a um, uh, the lib guides from COS. And I will go ahead and have. Um, uh, our IT guy put that in the chat as well. If you do want to know more about the Royal Chicano Air Force, the LibGuides have put together uh, quite a nice little collection for you there. So it's libguides.cos.edu, and you'll be able to see a little bit more about the RCAF and our IT person. We'll put that in the chat for us. Next slide, please. Uh, and then so that you know, also April 10th, we will be having, we will be blasting Chicano music off of Facebook. <laughs> uh, we have uh, our DJ, Mr. Eddie Salas, and we're hoping to hear back from uh, another guest. We're hoping to get Omet to come back. And from five to nine, we will be uh, giving people a chance to understand Chicano music because we've, we've tried so hard to show the art and to show some of the other things, but we wanted to go ahead and give them a sampling of the wide variety uh, and a beautiful taste of Chicano music as well. So look at our Facebook so that you can get the link for that. Uh, the 25th of April, we'll be having our first, what we're calling, or not first, but our second, what we're calling a youth platica, uh, so that we will have youth be able to engage in conversations. That's where our extension is going, but we will be sponsoring the Singing Our Way to Freedom. So again, uh, if you want a ticket to that show, you need to email us at seeingandunseen1 at gmail.com or again, make a comment on the Facebook uh, uh, Ricardo Favela Expressions of Chicano Art. Um, 
And then we just remind you that the show is on until April 30th. You can come see it in person uh, Wednesday through Saturday. You do need to make an appointment. Uh, and again, you'll need to email uh, the Visalia Arts or give them a call so we can set that up for you. Um, I'd be happy to give somebody a tour if you're around, if it works out. Uh, but thank you to our guests. It was lovely to have this nice chat with you today. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Lucia Vasquez, and I'm the program manager uh, for this uh, 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 this project. Uh, I'd like to thank our host uh, and and fellow planning um, uh, planning committee member uh, Eddie Salas. And, and our guest, I know Richard didn't get a chance to make it <laughs> for too long, but we know how busy he is. We know you're all busy. We so appreciate uh, that you were able to make it tonight. Uh, uh, Tina and Josie, I uh, look forward to, um, to seeing you again, and please come to the show. I don't know that we have uh, something in the comments that we need to address, but we do have people that are coming, coming to the show. So thank you. Thank you so much. Any uh, the parting words? Anybody? I had at least do the disclaimers, but we don't have to rush off. Uh, Eddie? Oh, yeah. Aquí estamos y no nos vamos. We're here. We ain't going nowhere. This is just the first installment. Thank you. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, Josie, you want to say goodbye? Thank you, guys. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And um, I'm so happy for the show to be up. And I hope to see it all tomorrow. As I drive north and listen to Radio Bilingue. <laughs> I will see you there. Thank you. Florentina? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. And um, as always, it was it was lovely to talk to you, Tia and Eddie. Appreciate you guys so much. Thank you, Lucia. And thank you to everyone who is putting comments in the chat. I really appreciate your support. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you to our Zoom master and thank you for our committee. And again, the work doesn't stop here. So if you'd like to be involved, uh, please uh, contact me, seen and unseen1 at gmail.com. We've got a great team and we're always looking for other people. Again, the LibGuide is uh, available to everyone uh, that has more information. Thank you so much.